Assalamu alaikum and welcome to With the Prophet. I'm Ali Coleman, I'll be your host. We're continuing to look at the interactions that the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, had with the people around him during his lifetime. We have now reached the subject of uh, part two of the sinners. Uh, our guest from Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Asim El Hakim. Assalamu alaikum, welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And it is an honor for me to be here with you. It's my honor as well, and look forward to great conversation as always. So, this is part two of our discussion about the sinners. A uh, very insightful uh, discussion we had earlier. We'd like to continue with a, a question about uh, making an important distinction. Uh, in our conversation, we were wanting to make a distinction between different types of sinners and the different responses that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had with these, with these people. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين It goes without saying mm -hmm. that people differ in their knowledge, in their intellect, in their upbringing and you cannot simply treat them all as one mm -hmm. And that is why Allah created people according to their levels. You have bosses, you have subordinates, you have leaders and you have followers. And from this point, if you look at it from this angle and you search and study the way the Prophet ﷺ used to deal with sinners, you'd find that there is a big difference between him dealing with people with knowledge who would make mistakes mm -hmm. and those who did not have knowledge. Okay. For example, those who were ignorant, the Prophet ﷺ would deal with them in a very nice manner, kind, educating, mm. like a father. Ign it, the ignorance could come by many ways. Maybe they're youthful. Maybe they're foreigners, maybe they have a different faith, so on and so forth. Correct. For example, the story that we've mentioned before about the Bedouin who came and urinated in the masjid. Yes. The Prophet Hassan did not reprimand him. He simply said, my nephew, these masjids were not built for such filth. They were built for prayer, dhikr, and reciting the Quran. End of story. Another man speaks during the prayer when someone sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, while in congregational prayer, mm. the guy says, mm -hmm. Yarhamukumullah. And when the people look at him in a way just to make him stop, he shouts again, May, uh, 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 يعني, ummaya, he says, May my mother loses me. May my mother lose me. Why are you looking at me? During the prayer in the masjid. Mm. So they started clapping their thighs. So he understood that they want him to stop. And then after the prayer, simple. The Prophet brought him and he said, my nephew, the prayer is not made for people to talk <laughs> in worldly <laughs> matters. Right. And end of story. Mm. However, when you move and shift in your study, you will find that in some incidents, the Prophet ﷺ was intentionally harsh because the person who'd made the mistake was knowledgeable. Okay. He was not like any Tom, Dick, or Harry. Mm -hmm. For example, Abu Dharr al-Ghafari, one of the old people to embrace Islam, one of the few early Muslims. He had a feud with Bilal. So in a moment of anger, he said, Bilal, you are the son of a black woman. Bilal's mother was black, so he wasn't lying, mm. but it wasn't said in a sense of honoring him, yeah. but rather wanting to humiliate him. Mm -hmm. Bilal did not reply. He went to the Prophet, he complained, and the Prophet summoned Abu Dhar, and he said, you are a man of ignorance. Mm. So Abu Dhar, who was old, he said, the Prophet of Allah, after this age, I'm a man of ignorance. Mm. Said, yes saying this to your brother and so and so and so. Mm -hmm. In another incident, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, 
May Allah be pleased with him and with his father, a great companion who was learned and close to the Prophet comes to him once with clothes dyed with saffron, mm -hmm. a special dye that only the disbelievers wear. Okay. And the Prophet prohibited it, alayhi The Prophet, when he saw this, he didn't say to him, Abdullah, you're not allowed to wear this, or you know the ruling. What did he say? He said to him, Abdullah, did your mother order you to wear this? Mm -hmm. Immediately he understood the question that was rhetorical, but he, it was meant to uh, uh, sort of open his eyes. Yeah. So immediately Abdullah repented and said, O Prophet of Allah, shall I wash them mm. to rest restore their previous uh, uh, color? The Prophet said, no, burn them. Mm. So this is a financial punishment for the mistake that he had done. And the thing can go on and on and on. The different types of... Uh, mm -hmm. His beloved wife, Aisha, the Prophet is in expedition. He comes back home, tired, eager to meet his wife. She's eager to meet him. She says, I covered a door in the home, like a closet, with a piece of cloth, but it, it had drawings on them. And we know that drawings of living creatures in Islam is haram, mm. uh, 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 like animals, like human beings. The Prophet entered the house and would not move from the doorway. And she said, and he was angry. She said, oh Prophet of Allah, I seek Allah's forgiveness. What have I done? He said, don't you know that the owners and those who drew this or these images mm -hmm. are being punished and tormented on the Day of Judgment. So immediately she took it down, cut it into pillows and stuffed it and th the images were gone. Okay. You can go on and on and on. And this shows you mm -hmm. that whenever there's someone who is ignorant or someone who has a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. a boy, a man, a young man, comes to the Prophet and he says, O Prophet of Allah, while the companions are all surrounding him, allow me to fornicate. Now, what would you expect the reaction of the companions? I'm sure they were flabbergasted. They were, were overboard. Yeah. What are you doing? And the Prophet said, shh, let him say what mm. he wants. Okay. He's addressing me, mm -hmm. not you. And this shows you the etiquette of dealing with people. <laughs> Now, if a youngster comes in and said, Sheikh, can I uh, uh, smoke pot? Mm. Oh, you're kafir, you're this, you, you're disgrace for your family. The guy is asking. So he has to be taught. And he's not an arrogant person or an intellectual, educated person. He doesn't know. What does the Prophet say, Alaihissalam? Come, my son. So the boy comes in. Come closer. He comes closer to the Prophet, Alaihissalam. Then the Prophet deals with him with the way that he deals with a son, mm -hmm. someone he loves and cares for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he says, do you allow this to your mother? He said, may Allah forgive you, Prophet of Allah. Of course not. Do you allow fornication for your mother? He said, no. <laughs> so the Prophet said, likewise, people have mothers and don't, they don't want this to happen to them. Would you allow this for your sister? Would you allow this for your aunt, for your daughter, for so and so? Mm -hmm. So the Prophet started listing to mm -hmm. him the relatives and the close ones to him. And the man says, may Allah forgive you, O Prophet of Allah, no. And then he said, likewise, people would not accept this for their own. So it takes two to tango. Right. It's not only what you desire, right. what others may suffer from. And then the Prophet, in a loving way, places his hand on the boy's chest and he says, Oh Allah, cleanse his heart, preserve his private part mm -hmm. and give him the needed chastity or like the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, hassan farjah wa tahir qalba. The Prophet is giving him this beautiful dua. The companion said, after that incident, the boy did not look at any uh, a woman in a haram way. Mm, mm, mm. So 
how do we treat sinners nowadays? How do we treat people who sing, who act, who may do things that are sinful, but we don't know their background? Don't we look down at them? Don't we despise them and feel that they are scum? Yeah. Why is this? Yes. This is because Allah has blessed us for so long in being practicing, knowledgeable, being around righteous people to the extent that we think that we are the elite. Mm -hmm. And hence, when we see someone going against our ways, shaitan intervenes, Satan comes in his presence and says, ah, look at this guy. He's doing this, he's doing that. Makes us take things that we would regret in an, in an authentic hadith. Mm -hmm. Two brothers, one was righteous and one was a drunkard. So this righteous person every single time would say, come on my brother, quit drinking. This is bad for you, this is sinful. And the brother says, it's none of your business. This is between me and Allah. Mm. And one day, this righteous practicing brother said to his brother, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. Allah, this is the hadith, authentic hadith. Okay. The Prophet says, Allah said, who is he to swear that I would never forgive that sinful person? I have forgiven that sinful person and I have nullified all of your good deeds. Wow. This means that we should learn from the Prophet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not to prejudge mm -hmm. people, not to make assumptions, and definitely not to deal with them in a harsh way unless it is justified and for a legitimate reason. Mm. Sheikh, we're ready as a good uh, breaking pl point uh, for our break. We will come back to continue our discussion about the sinners. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to With the Prophet. Uh, we are continuing with, with Sheikh Awesome on our discussion about the sinners and how the Prophet, peace be upon him, interacted with them among other peoples around him during his lifetime. Uh, excellent. Um, I, you, you touched a number of points before the break that I wanted to get to. We do have a problem of looking down, looking negatively upon people who are sinners. Um, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, forbade us from insulting them, belittling them, assuming this uh, arrogance or this assumption of uh, superiority somehow. Uh, looking down on people, uh, the word that we use, self-righteousness perhaps, um, but whether it was during or uh, after, let's say someone was caught and punished, uh, maybe it was a public case, uh, would you like to talk about that? Because after someone has paid the price for you know, their wrongdoing, you know, there's no reason for continuing the punishment. And the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke about that. Well, first of all, in the legal system mm. in the U.S. and elsewhere, they have something called double jeopardy. Yeah. So if someone was tried and there's a mistrial, usually they would not try him again mm -hmm. because that would cause double jeopardy in the sense. In Islam, the concept is better. And that is, if a person sins and he is punished for his sin, that is it. On the Day of Judgment, Allah is more generous to combine two, sin, two, two punishments on him. So let us assume okay. a person steals and all the conditions of stealing is fulfilled for us to amputate his hand according to the prescribed punishment. There are a number of conditions difficult to um, be combined. But if someone does them all, then the Muslim judge has to issue the prescribed punishment. Now, after being his hand amputated, then what? On the Day of Judgment, he would come clean. Mm, mm -hmm. There would not be any sin upon him for stealing. And this is hitting two birds with one stone. The Prophet 
when he dealt with those who make mistakes while they possess the knowledge. A woman from the tribe of Mahzum used to steal. Mm -hmm. She was caught red-handed. The Prophet ﷺ ordered that her hand to be amputated. The, her tribe sent Usama ibn Zayd, the beloved companion who the Prophet ﷺ loved him and his father. His father was Zayd ibn Haritha, the so-called adopted son of Muhammad ﷺ. So he went to talk to the Prophet ﷺ about the punishment and if it can be reduced. The, pun the Prophet ﷺ was outraged. Hmm. And he said, Usama, you are talking and interceding with me about one of the prescribed punishments of Allah. By Allah, if my daughter Fatima were to steal, I would have chopped her hand off. Okay. Okay. So the hand of this woman was amputated and the companions describe her as becoming afterwards righteous, practicing, and the Prophet made dua for her. Hmm. So it is not Islamic to keep on rubbing it mm -hmm. and reminding people mm -hmm. of their previous sins. Mm -hmm. There was a man by the name of an numan and he used to joke with the Prophet ﷺ and make him laugh. And some narrations say that his name was Abdullah. And they used to nickname him as the donkey. Why is that? Because this man was a compulsive drinker. So he drank so many times. And after each time, he, he would be brought uh, uh, in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet would order them to flog him 40 lashes. Mm -hmm. So he came so many times repeatedly till one day one of the companions said to the prophet uh, said to his friend while the prophet was listening may allah curse him how many times he's brought yeah. in front of the prophet yeah. mm -hmm. why doesn't he learn his lesson yeah but what did the prophet say he said do not aid satan upon your brother for by allah it is my testimony that he loves allah and his messenger now compare apple to apple this is a drunkard this guy drinks, it's a major sin. And he drinks until he's wasted. And he was brought up like tens of times to be flogged publicly. Mm. Yet, this did not prevent the Prophet ﷺ from testifying that there is love in the heart of this individual mm -hmm. towards Allah and towards myself. It, it, it almost sounds like exactly what we hear therapists say about people facing addiction, uh, a completely sympathetic understanding of the plight of people who are addicted. Yes, but, but we have to be careful. Mm. Sometimes uh, a therapist and, and shrinks would go overboard to justify sins. So they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, he stole because he was not conscious or he had a trauma like 20 years ago that made him rape or uh, kill, or, but this is unjustifiable. Mm. He's a human being, he's sane, but at the same time, we have to weigh the pros and cons. If he committed a sin and was punished for it, that is it. Mm. And this is mm -hmm. how we should deal with sinners, not to make an overkill. You do not kill a mosquito with a cannon. S someone who does a mistake, someone who does something that is sinful. Mm -hmm. You don't simply come and make this a catastrophe or the end of the world. This is particularly a um, uh, sensitive issue for um, the African Americans in my country uh, because, you know, a part of, uh, there's a lot of uh, unfairness, injustice, uh, disproportionate numbers of African Americans are systematically dealt with, targeted and dealt with in the justice system. And once you get saddled with criminal charges, they will ride, they can really destroy your life. Mm -hmm. They'll stay with you forever, even after you've paid your debt to society, you've gone, you've been convicted, you go to prison. A lot of times in most U.S. states, you can't participate in the democratic process. You lose the right to vote. You can't get a job. It's difficult to get a job. It forces you back into 
you know, the same lifestyle. And so you're paying for the rest of your life for something that you may have done when you were a foolish kid. So this is a very refreshing perspective mm -hmm. uh, that we're, we're getting from you on this. I, I, all of us, regarding children, I'd like to ask a question about children. Uh, the question is about how to rightly guide children away from becoming sinners in the first place. Um, it goes without saying that parents want to inculcate, to encourage righteousness in their children. Um, the, the question is about the best way to achieve this. Uh, is it through a loving relationship with the child and then everything just kind of falls naturally into place? Or do, does a parent need to be more active, and proactive, uh, looking, being attentive uh, for and rightly responding when the mistakes are being made by kids? We have to, as stated before, weigh the pros and cons. When it comes to kids, we have to give them unconditional love compassion but at the same time we have to draw lines that they may not cross mm -hmm. see the prophet was reported that whenever he heard or sensed a lie from one of his relatives mm -hmm. one of his household he would abandon and ignore that person until he repents to Allah so here we are talking about the concept of al-hajr or abandoning, abandoning and uh, boycotting an individual. The Prophet used to do this because it paid off. Likewise, we have to, in order to be obeyed, we have to give something. So you cannot just simply say Simon says and you expect the kids to comply. You have to convince them. You have to give them quality time. You have to uh, uh, substitute them with good things in the place of the things that they were banned from having. Without this, it would be very difficult. We can ban our children from using smart smartphone, mm -hmm. though I consider them to be stupid phone because they teach people how to become stupid. But we can ban them because there's YouTube, there's Face Hell or Facebook as they call it, and there are this, these social media stuff. But banning them is not helpful because they can find other means to go around it. Mm -hmm. So convincing them, mm. trying to make them understand, mm. talking to them in a sense that they feel that they are intellectual people. When we give them responsibility, when we give them trust, mm -hmm. then we win their hearts. But when we always suspicious of what they're doing, give me your phone. Yeah. Let me look yeah. at your browser. Mm -hmm. What did you do? No, I don't believe that you were studying. And we keep on accusing them unjustly and unfairly. This <laughs> calls them to actually cheat. This is, this is like mom and dad becoming uh, the police or whatever. We're, we're almost out of time, just a couple minutes left. Uh, maybe we could ask about a very simple question. What's the potential harm, danger for embarrassing people uh, once they, their, their sins uh, have become public, publicly known? Uh, the question is about avoiding embarrassment. How did the prophet handle this, peace be upon him? Um, and what are the potential harms or dangers? This is depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you have no other choice or alternative than to change it and stop this sin publicly yeah. because it's taking place publicly. Mm -hmm. But if it was concealed, then it is a must to conceal it. For example, during Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ was on his camel. Behind him was Al-Fadl ibn Al-Abbas, the cousin of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So, a woman comes and speaks to the Prophet والسلام, asking a question and Al-Fadl was a handsome man. So he kept on staring at her and the Prophet would turn his face and he goes back and stare and the Prophet keeps on turning his face not to look at her. So his uncle said, why are you doing this to your cousin? And then the Prophet said والسلام, I saw a young man and a young woman, and I was afraid that shaitan 
would make a connection. So the Prophet did this while all the other companions were looking. Now one would say, oh, you've embarrassed him. Yeah, but he brought this upon himself. Mm. And this was done publicly. I cannot simply say, okay, I'll talk to him a couple of days later and allow him to continue in the sin. This is unlike when someone does something privately and I come to know of it and then I talk to him privately as well without exposing him. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sheikh, for uh, your answers, your time for all these uh, questions. Barakallahu feekum. And thank you for being with us. We hope that Allah accepts our time together and it was beneficial for you as well. We would uh, end this episode now and continue with, with the Prophet uh, and in the future. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.